Good morning, everyone. I hope I'm audible. Super. So the idea is very simple. We were, uh, Suman and I were having a conversation some time back, and we were like, let's not have a formal session. Let's have a conversation between four friends. Right? So that's what we'll try and do. Uh, and when four friends are talking, feel free to interrupt. Right? So that's how I'd love to start. Uh, I think also uh, I'll say that uh, uh, it should not be built. We have just started building. So it should be built. We are in the process of building. So. We have, I think I think we have what 0.01 percent done, so to say. Yeah, and the whole ecosystem is growing so fast, right? So I'll try and divide the conversation into culture and commerce, right? Uh, two important fundamentals. Culture is built by uh, organizations which have people first. Commerce is built by uh, you know uh, organizations who have business first, right? So what is the right intersection of it to create the right communities is what we're trying to delve into. To begin with, maybe. Uh, starting Himanshu, and we'll try and go in this order. Maybe a quick uh, round of introduction, and um, you could also speak about, uh, you know, your favorite experience of building a community, or you know, one of your best learnings as a marketer. Sure. So hey, hi, uh, I'm Himanshu. I'm co-founder for Social Panga. I was the first mafia at, at Panga. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for inviting me for my best learning. Thanks a lot for hosting this out. Uh, so culture. I believe culture is not having a bean bag in your office, right? A uh, lot of time people have seen bean bags as a culture piece, right? Uh, culture is built by what kind of work that you're doing, right? The merit of the work also defines a culture to a larger extent, right? So all the organizations, all the companies, global setups, right? It's defined by the products they have built, if you, if you look at Meta, if you look at Google, right? Or if you look at services company uh, with respect to the value they deliver to the client, right? And if all of us as, as an organization is aligned to that one goal, right, uh, is what defines a culture in a nutshell. Uh, it could be anything. It could be service excellence. It could be a customer first approach, whatever it is. You pick up Amazon, you pick up Flipkart, you pick up Mintra. Indian global context, right? It defined that one goal. And everybody in the organization think about that goal. And then you define your mission, vision, and other pieces to it, right? And when everybody is aligned to that one goal, it kind of moves in the community space, right? So if you look at it non-professionally, I'm, I'm a cyclist, right? I have a single goal post to do a 100 kilometer on a Sunday. So everybody has that one goal in that group, in a community, right? So professionally, you have one goal post. Personally, you have one goal post. That defines as a starting point for a community too, per se. Very interesting. Uh, maybe maybe if, you could, if, uh, if you could also touch upon one of the, uh, I, I think Manipal Hospitals is one of your uh, you know, star campaigns of the year, you know, or any other campaign which you would have done which, which is community first in nature, and maybe some learnings out of it. So uh, it's just not about campaign, right? Uh, so take an example of Mama Earth. Uh, so we have been working with this brand for a while now. Uh, the starting point of that brand, uh, I think everybody's aware of Gazelle and, and Vanun, right? Uh, Gazelle became mom, and then post that, uh, the brand was built. They leverage community to a larger extent, right? That community become a starting point for her to experiment to do a pivot on the product and then see people have a response to it, right? Again, what is happening these days is people start thinking, ke, hey, how are we going to monetize the community, correct? And that's the first step that you should not take. That's in a don't space, not in do space. What are you adding to the community as a starting piece? And then you start doing a brand integration and other pieces to it. Interesting perspective. How about you, Vikas? Yeah, I think Audible, right? Everyone at the back? No, not audible. Yeah. We just hold it closer yeah, to the. I think this works. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, picking up from what Himanshu said, I think it's really about creating value, right? And people need to feel connected. The users, whoever you're trying to build a community with, need to feel connected, right? And that's really at the heart of uh, building those communities. And, and that means the brand that's creating it or whoever's creating that needs to, to add value, needs to be able to be 
authentic and allow others in the community to be authentic for, for them to really take out the value, right? And that's what we've seen with many of the brands that we work with. Uh, one of the examples would be Dhan, which is a trading app, right? And, and what we try to do there is actually build a community of day traders, build a community of folks that live a life being a trader. Uh, so right from building uh, an anthem and a song that they can relate to, to actually having uh, you know, communities on, on closed door channels like Telegram or also public channels, right? And I think being able to connect those dots to people who feel they're sitting in a room and working from nine to three uh, looking at a screen and they feel neglected, right? And that's the insight that we tapped onto and looked at how do we build that community. And so it's really about connecting, connecting those dots and like Himachu said, it's not about selling anything at all. That community is to exchange ideas, insights, learnings, uh, and, and really connect with folks that, that know what you're going through, and that's what makes that community really work. Interesting. Yeah, I agree. Art of selling is, you know, genuine value addition, right? If you can genuinely value add, right, uh, people will buy, right? How about you, uh, Suman? I mean, I sincerely believe that uh, building communities, uh, you know, as a first-time entrepreneur, uh, we started with a product, and for and Buffalo Soldiers happened by accident. Uh, <coughs> all of us needed to realize that uh, are we entrepreneurs enough, uh, right? And we bootstrapped it all along. So for me, building community starts right at home. Uh, uh, Himanshu was talking about culture, and I'm, I so agree with him because I think uh, when we started off, we all call ourselves startups. And I feel that uh, because we are independent and we are, we are able to say this, uh, that if we call ourselves startup, we need to start behaving like startups. I think uh, one of the things that we enabled, uh, one of the things that we enabled uh, at Buffalo Soldiers is that uh, we give equity to each and every member. So that for me is uh, something that is non-negotiable. Uh, so I feel that uh, another thing we have always talked about, right, is that uh, Everyone comes, and a lot of people have experienced this, all of us. Uh, uh, people think it's a fun place, right? Uh, the journey doesn't end there, right? It's a fun place to work. Uh, so what happens is that building that culture, talk, I feel, is really easy. Uh, for the first two years or three years, uh, we practically grew from, and I've said this enough, uh, uh, from five and a half people. There was one intern who was double timing in one room in my house uh, to uh, uh, just 100 people now. So uh, <coughs> we feel that uh, while we were talking about this culture, uh, we never really saw that culture coming through till about last year. And it happens very, it happened very organically as it, you know, kind of permeated through the ranks. And now we see the benefit of that culture happening. So I feel it all starts at, uh, you know, while we start building communities, the community should be built uh, at home and then, you know, we take it across to clients. Interesting, interesting. I, I, in fact, also loved your name. Can you tell me more about what's the logic and what's all, the meaning of the name? All, all my uh, other co-founders were come. I was driving one day, uh, all the, I had still not quit my job and uh, they were coming up with uh, normal names, uh, Bob Marley, of course. Like, uh, I love the song, so. That's how the name came through. I've tried to give many other reasons at different places. Uh, I have like one reason every month, but it's a Bob Marley song. Interesting, interesting. Let's let's jump on to another whole new beast. Speaking, you know, the new beast, uh, which is the most spoken about beast these days, is Gen Z, right? Uh, have Have you been building Gen Z first communities, and what's your experience dealing with them? Any of you could pick it up. Again, first and foremost thing, having an awesome sneaker uh, or having a tattoo, it's not Gen Z. <laughs> Let me put that on the table. <laughs> so uh, as, as somebody who's a millennial, uh, uh, I, I've, I've speaking to a lot of Gen Z folks, the way people used to speak to me 10 years back to build on that consumer inside, I figured out very, very clearly, uh, these two things doesn't design, define Gen Z. Uh, what we've noticed, uh, this is something which I've noticed last 40, 40, 50 years. Uh, fashion, in a way, also defined what kind of mindset people is having. Uh, in fact, I saw one of your LinkedIn posts 
when you visited something, right? Uh, why Gen Z likes to wear loose clothes? If you go double click on it, right? It's a sense of freedom. I don't give a damn. Uh, size doesn't define me, right? It's a mindset piece, right? Uh, and when you kind of truly understand people, right? Fashion is one of the way, if you look at 70s, 80s, 90s, our fashion days of 20 to 30, correct? Uh, is one of the area, right? But nobody defines us and wearing uh, clothes with a specific size is one of the pieces, right? X hundred other things to it, right? I own my own space. And that's also driven by what is happening happening to India from an economical standpoint. Like for my parents, roti kapda makan was big stuff. For us, we moved to the next level where convenience was one. Uber Ola came into picture, Zumato and all came into picture. Now, that's by default. What's next for them? That hates about me, it's not about our stuff. So, I'm not talking about community, but to understand that mindset and start building products on top of it. So, I always believe that two things are going to define the next 10, 15 years of our journey. One is Gen Z, second is luxury. Right, because everybody has a purchasing power uh, uh, to it. So if, if a product or a community could be built on top of it, we're going to prosper in the next 10, 15 years. Interesting, interesting. Let me, let me speak more about uh, this uh, particular post which I had uh, written. So it happened exactly at Geo, just right across the uh, doors. Uh, I, d I was attending this event called as All You Can Street. Right at the entrance of the event, uh, there was a hoarding which said, uh, a, a banner, whatever, which said, if you're not into street culture, this is going to be a culture shock. And it was a culture shock for me. I'll, I, you know, I'll narrate what exactly happened that day. So I walked into one of the stores. I probably was the only single person in the 55,000 square feet big conference or event or whatever it was happening who was wearing a jeans, right? So already I was feeling out of place, right? And um, so I walked into one of the stores and I asked, you know, I was seeing some styles and I was like, can I see a medium sized t-shirt in this like dramatically everyone paused around me and they were like what did you just ask for a size like huh that's how people buy like no that's not how gen z's buy right we we buy what we like it doesn't matter what the size is so i was literally convinced by stairs to buy two sizes more than what i generally wear i honestly still not have courage to wear that but i hope i wear it sometime soon so yeah some very, very interesting things are happening. And like you rightly mentioned, it's Gen Z, Gen Z do not want to be defined by predefined global norms. Right? medium large I will choose what I want to wear. If it fits my size, great, or else I'll be comfortable in what I want to wear. So, you know, so that also is an insight for so many brands, right? So many brands have been thinking certain set of verticalization of sizes, right? And verticalization of a lot of cultures where, you know protocols which were there, right? If they start thinking horizontal, they start thinking design first, thought first, then I think magic can happen. Yeah. Vikas, how about you? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, going deeper into what they like and, and that's really where our jobs as marketeers begin, right? And and often the way we connect those dots is uh, they, they have their own preferences of freedom, their own preferences of, of trying new things. They experiment a lot more. So, I, and I think that's really how we pick up the kind of, of, of brand messaging that you want to do, right? So, for brands that we work with, often it, it is about uh, also the kind of content you create because they, ha they have a lot more uh, options, they have a lot more, uh, they, they have lesser patience than many of us have. They get distracted very quickly. So, and, and that's really what you want to try and do. So, the kind of communication we would create for a brand that's targeting that audience would be very, very different. and, and Frankly, building a community for, for Gen Z is not easy, right? Because they have zillion options, they have enough to, uh, uh, to keep them distracted. And hence, uh, it, while we try and do that for some of our brands, it's really about can you still connect with them and, and can you build that brand love? I think that's still something that we, we have probably tried to achieve and do. But building a community where they really feel connected, I think that's still probably work in progress in some sense. Interesting. Suman? I think uh, Gen Z's are uh, fashion in contradiction, right? Uh, they like vapes a lot too. I mean, on a serious note, I mean, I think I think uh, we we have been talking about the millennial work culture, right? Uh, and I think 
I have met with Gen Zs, uh, especially you know, uh, in our office, uh, who are two different kinds, right? The one that you were talking about, who are fleeting uh, 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 sense of they move on from one thing to another, and I have met the other kind, which are which have very very you know kind of millennial work ethic. So it's very difficult, as you were saying, to uh, uh, bracket uh, what exactly is a Gen Z, right? So, but uh, when we were working for brands like uh, say, fast track, right? It's very important that uh, we we let uh, some of our uh, very young folks, including uh, somebody who was joined like two months back uh, from NIFT, uh, to lead that conversation because you know they kind of understand, they kind of bring those contradictions together uh, beautifully. So I feel that that's something that uh, uh, is not defined enough. Uh, uh, I, I think as we move forward, we will understand uh, how the generation of Gen Z kind of settles in. So, but, I mean, I, it's, it should be an ongoing process. So, I heard two things, Vikas, you, men you mentioned about uh, millennial work ethics and distracted. Uh, the, the sense, so I, I've, I've personally spoken to a lot of those in an organization and outside also. I believe they're just different, the way we were different for our parents. Right, so when, when I started back in 2003, on my first company, my father, and my, my mom and dad couldn't even understand what we're doing. So the way my parents couldn't understand us, I think we're not able to understand the Gen Z. Right? Suddenly feeling older. We're suddenly feeling older, right? I always, <laughs> <laughs> I think four old people speaking about Gen Z. <laughs> Interesting, so let's, let's slightly tangent further. Right, um, I'll, I'll jump to digital campfires, right? Now what I mean by that is, you know, when, when the whole social media revolution started, the whole fundamental was, you know, let's get to know the world, let's get to, you know, expand our network, let, let, me, let me try and meet so many new people, maybe meet a lot of people of my past. But I think a lot of things within the digital ecosystem are maturing enough where the original subconscious strategy was expanding the network, now the strategy or you know the mindset is to narrow it down to relevance right now what i mean by that is uh, digital campfires like a reddit digital campfires like a telegram group right so there are so many of these new age telegram groups or new age reddit groups or whatever there are so many discord groups and whatnot have you seen some initial success or some success in uh, communities beyond you know your traditional social media as i call it yeah, I think, uh, yeah, we've done some of it in Quora, some of it in Reddit, and I think uh, what we realized over time is authenticity there is very important, right? You you want to be participating both as a brand as well as maybe uh, consumers that love you and have that connect with you, but if if that conversation or or what you're saying doesn't feel real and authentic, I think that, you know, starts breaking apart. Uh, I think the other part is consistency, right? Because brands obviously... So you have to find what is it that uh, that second or third channel that you really want to go deeper into and often brands that have succeeded are the ones that have consistently built that with the right kind of content and value, found the right influencers, real consumers to be part of those communities and that's when that flywheel starts working, right? Because otherwise you, you do it for a few months and it doesn't work. Building that community is, is a journey over many, many quarters to, to make that really come to life. Yeah. I, I, I can think of an example of uh, Maggie. I think uh, they did this globally as well, where they monetized WhatsApp by investing in content. What they did was, uh, and again, disclaimer, we've not done this campaign. I read about it online. Uh, what they did was they, st uh, oh, lovely. So uh, yeah, of course, why, why don't you speak about it? I think it's a it's an interesting campaign, right? One recipe a day, right? You're talking about the same campaign? Yeah. Yes. So I'll I'll touch upon the campaign in a bit, but speaking of what you mentioned, right, or the community piece, uh, I think what is happening with multiple platforms, right? You pick a platform like Discord, right? Uh, every platform, every generation feels it's my platform, correct? For us, our parents was Facebook, Insta, then Reddit came, Telegram came, right? So I was I was chit chatting with one of my cousin who. Uh, is in, in college, right? He is a lot more on Snapchat uh, versus on Instagram. So his photo sharing. Uh, texting, like their routine texting is Snapchat. Is Snapchat. Yeah. It's not on Insta, it's not on WhatsApp also. 
So what is happening is that the moment they feel that this platform, this is called Snapchat or whatever, is, is for me, is where my friends are, not family, right? Uh, is where they start building on the uh, community Affinity. piece. Affinity community piece. Maggie, yeah, sure. So Maggie, um, you know what I, uh, you know what I saw was every single day they used to, you know, they curated a whole community of people who are cooking food by themselves. So what they would do is every single day they would send in a recipe. So a new recipe every single day on your WhatsApp message, right? As simple as that. It may or may not have a Maggie masala in it. We're not talking about noodles, of course. We're talking about Maggie masala, right? So. That's what they did, right? Um, they genuinely curated the whole community. What last I checked, they had about a 200,000 active subscribers to that community who are regularly seeing recipes on that, right? So that's genuine community creating outside of an Instagram, outside of a you know Facebook, outside of a Twitter to genuinely add value to the lives of audience. Yeah. So so yeah, that's it. Coming back, you were saying something. Come on. Just saying that our entire journey actually didn't begin with Buffalo Soldiers. It began with football because I'm a complete football uh, fanatic. So uh, we were building something called Foot the Ball. And the whole idea was because football fans, I'm a huge Arsenal supporter and a Barcelona supporter. So football fans on any other of these apps do not have uh, like affinity based community. And we were trying to build that. Uh, so what happened was, uh, you know, uh, recently when we were leading you know, the entire global chess league and for the first time chess uh, was being played in a team event and all of that. We realized that a community uh, was being built on YouTube, which was so interesting because uh, we felt that the community would be built on maybe on Instagram because some of the players, uh, we thought it might be built on Twitter because Magnus Carlsen is there and Vishwanathan Anand is there. Uh, but it started building on YouTube and that's, that's the difference. So it's, it's so fractured right now, right? Some, some, some are using, as you were saying, Discord. Uh, I started using Discord like about six months back. Uh, there are a lot of communities which are happening on Snapchat, but the Snapchat community right now is so low that uh, you know we, we, we are not kind of, uh, I think for the last two years, people have been always thinking about experimenting with the Snapchat community, particularly in India. But we, I, we haven't done that because I don't see the numbers there. Uh, but I think, yeah, it's a, it's a very fractured uh, community building that's happening uh, on, uh, between different age groups right now. By the way, Snapchat just crossed about 100 million users in India. So numbers are crazy on Snapchat and increasing by the day. True. Yeah. That's true. Coming back to numbers, right? Uh, we're in a world where everyone wants everything yesterday, correct? How do you, and again, happy to hear all your opinions, how do you justify long gestation periods in building the community? What are the success metrics which, say, you set as expectations for your clients when you're building a community when you know that you don't have anything to do in six effort in six months, you content in right? You have to see what happens Right. So what are some success metrics you utilize or you know you try and convince your clients with or you convince yourself with first more than your clients? Isn't it the same same roadmap of building a brand? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It takes time, right? So uh, Maggie is our client. So I, I was aware of that community which you're referring to. Uh, it also boils down uh, to what level of brand building you are, right? When your existence is questionable, right? When you're starting up a brand, starting a company, when your existence is questionable, you can't go back to a brand and say, a community, banate. right? Let somebody, let somebody try the product, right? First, my product itself has a question mark to it. Versus a legacy brand, uh, AB and Bev, Maggie, Nestle's of the world, where the product is already there, right? And then you start making peripherals on top of it, right? So we also need to understand at what level or journey the brand is. That is point number one. Point number two, like I take an example of Mama Earth, right? Where there was a common interest of a founder, right? She genuinely wants to understand what's happening. And organically, you start building it off, correct? It was not started with the Mama Earth. It was started with Gazal. And then, obviously, it finally boils down to the Mama Earth piece. That is second. Third, uh, you asked about a period, right? The moment you start looking at six months or in a year as a time frame, ki haan, after that I'm going to monetize the brand, uh, community, that's where downfall starts happening. You have to be extremely, extremely open, right? Like take an example of Maggie. Sometimes we don't even put a product there, right? 
it has to be driven by an interest, not by a common brand. Common brand is packaging it, but is not a driving force to it. So for me personally, I cannot put a time frame to with six months or 12 months. It's a very long term piece, right? Uh, Budweiser have built a community around sports, but it's consistently doing it year on year on year on year basis. Nike, I think everybody has seen the, year, uh, seen the movie and read the book, right? The community have been built consistently year on year and being honest to that piece. Whatever the, whomsoever a sponsor is, Nike is always there. So third is more from a consistent point of view. Interesting. Vikas? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, you mentioned a lot of big brands and I think, you know, that's what I wanted to touch upon that, you know, from, if you look at it from, from far, it looks like communities are built by large brands, but actually it's probably the opposite, right? You, if you look at many of those small Instagram handles, those smaller brands, those one outlet retail stores, they have powerful communities. They may only be 500,000 micro, micro communities. Yeah, 1,500 folks, but they know the brand, they know who runs it, they know what quality to expect, they know the service that they can expect. They exchange feedback, key, I want this, can you make it, right? And I think that's uh, that the myth around who is it relevant to it. I think it's relevant to every brand. It's can you find consumers that love you, love your brand, your product, and start scaling that, right? And figure out what the common thread is. And that common thread could be anything, but you need to figure out what that is. And, and we didn't touch upon this, but at the heart of it is having an amazing product, right? Because you cannot build communities around something that's, that's uh, subpar. So in many ways, even if it's a small brand, and probably there are folks here that works with, work with smaller, mid-sized brands, Find those consumers who love you and start from there and, and you'll eventually find a way to connect those dots and make that happen. I, I you know, so I agree with Vikas, like there yeah. is nothing more powerful than a micro community. I mean, we, we, we work with, you were talking about retail, right? We work with Uran and uh, so a lot of people uh, go to social media and think that what are the kind of followers you want? What are the kind of, so Uran, the one of the things that we, you know, kind of guided them to was the people who have their apps and they order from their apps, the retailers, the Kirana Walas, uh, we ensured that those Kirana Walas are actually following them on social media because uh, Chai wo Facebook ho or it's Instagram, at least wherever they are present, can you also follow them on social media because you are using this app as the lifeline of your business, right? So I think micro communities are the way to go. Yeah, and I just want to give an example. I mean, we didn't work on this. I was actually listening to a podcast uh, about Zeroda and how Zeroda actually scaled, right? And actually, Nitin was talking a lot about how they built that community of, of again, traders who uh, didn't like all these bigger companies and bigger apps because they didn't have a product that was catering to them, right? And they actually built a complete forum and community on the web, uh, not on the app, on the web. And that's actually how their flywheel started working for them, right? They were very small back then. And that, and this is almost seven, eight years ago. And that community is what fueled every big trader in India to start using them. And then the rest is history, so. Interesting, interesting perspective. There's a brand called Snitch, if you heard about it. Bangalore based, they have Shark Tank, uh, Siddharth. Uh, so they started with building a community around Gen Z and obviously product around the same. Now they opened a first store. Same thing, started with the community and then moved to the taking up on it. Also, another interesting thing I think which Vikas touched upon, which as marketeers, and I always tell my team as well that, you know, we are marketeers first, then we are advertisers, right? So uh, the four P's of marketing, it starts with product, right? Product plays price promotion. We are the fourth P of marketing. Product theek hoga, to baki sare P theek ho sakte hain, right? Uh, we've got the last couple of minutes. If we can have, you know, quick closing thoughts. We started with culture, we uh, moved towards commerce. So maybe, uh, you know, you could possibly uh, speak about your concluding thoughts in terms of how are you fostering a culture first, you know, uh, community within your organization. Each one of you could speak about it. I'm sure each one of you have been doing some fantastic work uh, in terms of curating some great culture. So, yeah, no, absolutely. I think uh, for, for, for us from day one, it was really about the team, the culture. We are about 350 team members now. Uh, and I, I, I would about 80% of our leadership team has been with us for upwards of five, six years, some even for eight, nine years. So, and I think the key to that is a mix of uh, 
the right kind of work. You need to have the right brands, exciting work. I think that's one big part of it because that's where the learning comes from. That's where they feel excited, they feel they're doing the right thing. So the brands and learning from it, I think, is one big part. The second is being able to have a culture of, of continuously uh, learning, continuously, you know, it's fine to make mistakes, but continuing to try new things, what, what you know, Harshil spoke about, being agile, trying out AI, I mean, and we, in fact, have a huge task force internally to make sure everyone experiments with AI, and then you figure out where the use cases for each teams are, right? But that agility, that, that ability to experiment and keep learning, I think that's the second part. And the third is, uh, you know, the basics around having a great HR team, your, uh, you know, you know, incentives, ESOPs, and I think all that mix and in, plays into play. In fact, I was uh, mentioning to somebody else that we, in fact, do a performance appraisal every six months, not every year, right? So there's an opportunity for top performers to actually uh, get, uh, move up the value chain in terms of in increments and promotions twice a year, right? And, and today, folks are restless. And, and we try and cater to that to some extent. It needs more work, it needs more effort, yeah. but that's how we build it up. Yeah. I think we have spoken enough, the time's up also out there. I'll just say one single line. If a first-time manager is treating his mentees or subordinates the way founders treat everybody, that clearly defines a culture because come from top to the first-time manager. There's no rocket science around it. If that's a good way to look at it. Maybe. Interesting, interesting. Suman, qu quick closing thoughts. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, as uh, one of the targets that I had for myself, uh, what is my role as the CEO? I think one of the roles is hiring, right? So from an intern uh, to uh, anyone who is joining us, I make the first call, uh, I close the last call, I, uh, I will do it till about the 200 or 250 people. Uh, that's my target. Uh, and I know it does get hard. Uh, <laughs> ask me about it. But I think, I mean, see, let's, let's be honest with ourselves. I mean, all of us, uh, uh, we call ourselves marketeers and all of that. And we tend to think that, you know, give it a lot of importance. We tend to think we know everything. We don't. We are idiots, basically. We are, you know, trying to figure out, we have a mere approximation of the truth that we try to find out. Right, and that's what we try to apply to many situations. Right, some of our best campaigns have happened like that, some of our best work has happened like that. When we went out of that uh, window, took a bet on a gut feeling that we had, one of us had, maybe I had, maybe you know, my co founders had, maybe my uh, creative lead had, right, and that's how one of the some of our best work has happened. So, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, and yeah, as Vikas was saying, right. Uh, we have started investing on AI. AI, I think uh, uh, people who know how to use AI, and that's what Harshil was also saying, uh, that they are the ones who will be successful. That is so very important to understand that every, every department will have a use case of AI in the next 24 months. Uh, it has already started in the creative teams. It has already started in the strategy teams. Uh, it will spread across, right? So, yep. Super. Thank you very much for the lovely conversation, lovely insights. Thank you very much.